welcome everybody to our year anniversary of the desktop team in DABA. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's so exciting. And we have a really special one planned for everybody today. We have Mark here to answer some amazing questions. And we have a, a wonderful um, class of middle schoolers in Minnesota here to join us and ask Mark some questions themselves too. Um, very exciting. I want to th say thanks to everybody that submitted questions online. Um, I look forward to um, asking them with Monica together. We're going to tag team this. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So um, this should be fun. Welcome, Mark. It Thank should you be. For being here. Um, yeah. So should we kick off with some questions? I think so. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, I think you guys have the questions, right? Do you want to okay. Send uh, uh, Club President Cam, we'll start with you. Okay, your question for Mark. <laughs> How old were you and what inspired you to create Ubuntu? Wow, so Ubuntu was started in 2004. And so then I would have been 31 years old. And um, I was inspired because it, it has always seemed to me amazing that people um, come together to make open source software. I think it's such a great combination of science and art and generosity and business and all sorts of great things that come together in, in open source software. Um, and I wanted to do something that open source software had made a huge difference in my life. It allowed me to explore all kinds of crazy, interesting things. Um, and so I wanted to do something that would have a positive impact in open source software and a positive impact in the world. And so after sort of talking to a bunch of people and thinking about it, I, I decided to form Ubuntu. And I was lucky enough to meet a, a great big crowd of sort of really special people who were deep into Linux. And I didn't know enough about Linux to really do anything useful, um, but I could, I could actually help them get things going. And that's how Ubuntu got started. Very cool, very cool. Okay, uh, Savannah, do you wanna go next? All right, come on up. What kind of sport? What kind of support did you have, and how long did it take you to make the first release? Um, well, the first release was very exciting. We um, we we all got together in April uh, in that year, and this was the first time we all met as a group. And um, we decided that we wanted to put out a release in six months, um, and so we gave ourselves just six months to go from zero to the first release of of Ubuntu. Um, it was a very intense time. Um, and uh, we, that, we, we, we knew that it was going to be a little crazy, so we codenamed that release the Warty Warthog. Um, but it all worked. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so that, that's, that's why the Warty Warthog, we decided it was going to be it was going to be a bit rough, but we would call it the Warty Warthog. Anyway, so the Warthog is now our kind of team, team mascot, and uh, it turned out not to be that Warty after all. Everything's been great since then. Okay, Rania, please. Okay. Do I get to ask some questions? I'm, I'm of really course. Ooh, <laughs> we should definitely Hello, have that. Hello, Mr. Am... Shuttleworth, um, important sir. Um, who taught you about Linux and open source before Ubuntu? And what kind of Linux did you like the most and why? Um, oh, that's such a great question. So I was at university in Cape Town. And uh, in those days, you know, I thought of computers as, as you know, just running Windows because that was the only thing that, that, that I'd ever seen and that most people used. Um, and so I was at university and one day, um, one of the kids in my class gave me a, a set of disks and said, you should try this. Um, and so I figured out quite quickly that uh, it was Linux. Um, and I, I snuck into the computer lab after hours <laughs> and I stayed in the computer lab all night, basically first getting Linux onto one of the machines in the computer lab and then realizing that I would get caught if, if, if it was still Linux in the morning. So I then had to figure out how to get Windows onto the same machine before everybody else showed up, which took me all night. I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> so, so that's where I kind of first encountered Linux. I was, trying to, I was trying to work with the internet. The internet was sort of very early. It was very new. It had just arrived in South Africa. Um, and Windows couldn't really work with the internet in those days. So I was just really interested in Linux because it would give me access to the internet, make it easy for me to try to build things for the internet. Um, and really that's been true ever since. Like Linux makes it easier for you to build interesting things, right? 
Very cool. And we have one more. Julia, come on up. Uh, how hard is it to make a software? And are you still working to make open software programs? Um, that's really interesting. Um, I think when you say how hard is something, um, I think you, you, you can absolutely write software. I promise you all of you can write software and you should have the confidence to dive in and, and enjoy writing software, right? There's thousands of different kinds of software that you can write. I think the more important thing is, is what, what, what do you want to create in the world, right? If you, if you want to um, um, help people you know, with this kind of thing in their life, then you're gonna end up writing this kind of software. If, you're gonna, if you wanna help people with that kind of thing in their life, then, then you're gonna end up writing that kind of software. So the question really isn't, you know, uh, uh, can you write software? The question is like, what software do you want to write and what do you need to learn to get there? For me, I'm, I'm very interested in, in enabling other people to write software. And so, you know, Ubuntu is a platform for people's creativity. They do all sorts of crazy different things. Some people right now, they're really interested in uh, what we call the Internet of Things. I don't know, have you guys played with any little devices? Have you played with like Raspberry Pis or? Jake has, Jake has. Yeah. So you know about the Internet of Things, right? You know that you can, you can have some idea, you can look around a room or a building or a, or a factory or a, or a sports field and you can say, well, I can do something interesting here. And you just take a little piece of hardware that's not very expensive and you take Linux and then you write a little piece of software that may not be that complicated and you do something really interesting. And for me, that's really wonderful, right? I think the IoT is going to open up a huge wave of creativity for entrepreneurs, for startups, for people just trying to make the world a better place. So we're doing a lot of work to try and make it easier for people to create internet things, right? And to do that in a way where those things will be secure and safe and you can plug them in at home and not worry about them. They're not going to be, they're not going to be kind of botnets mining crypto um, on, your, uh, on your home electricity supply. Um, that's the one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum, um, we're really interested in like big software where you've got thousands of pieces of software across hundreds of machines and you're trying to do like solve really, really big problems um, and to do that in very kind of agile ways to make that really easy. So that's what I find fun, right? There are all of these different kinds of software and what can we do in Ubuntu that makes it easier for people to, to live with all of those different kinds of software and, uh, and, and make the most of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, for our questions, but you mentioned that you might have a question or two. Tell me about the Penguin Call. How did you guys get founded? What do you do? All right. We started in 2019, and I think we have, just from that first year, raise your hand if you're a first-year student. I should have at least a couple. All right. Um, so from, from that first year back there, we have like, uh, Cam and Sophie, Cam was one of our founders. And then Sophie came in during, uh, the second season there that same year. So they're kind of our, you know, ground level. We, we started off in the after school here and I had run a Linux club at my previous school. And I suggested to our, our principal when I got hired, I said, we had some success with this at my last school. I think this could be a benefit. And she said, oh, that sounds great. Um, we have an after-school program. We could put it there. But we really didn't have an idea of just how things were going to happen or how fast or how big things were going to get. We started off with 14 kids. Next season, it was 18. We got shut down for COVID. And when we got shut down, we actually got up to over 20 because there were some kids that could join from home at that point. And we have kids learning to install, configure, and use Linux and open source software. We have kids recycling computers that are then used by other students. Some of those are used in kids' homes, and that became a big part of things with distance learning because of COVID-19. We provided all of the computers that our school used for distance learning, and at one point that was over 350 machines out in kids' homes. Uh, and all of that, that gear was either donated or it was purchased used. So we were able to keep the school's costs really, really low. Uh, and But then, now that we're back, a lot of those computers are being used here. If you take a look here in this computer lab, all of this hardware here is donated hardware. Um, so we're using all free and open source software on donated computers 
the only thing that that we have tied up money wise in this room for uh for the lab are some batteries uh so we have 32 computers um all even using for standardized testing this week for a few hundred dollars so yeah that's some of what we do and uh if i can ask another question how, how many of you have actually uh, tried tried programming and started writing writing software one form or another yeah raise and your four. hands let's let's see uh, look at that bigger number than i was anticipating that's wonderful hey that's great and um which is your favorite kind of programming environment programming language or tool okay which which programming language or tools are you guys using if you're pro javascript okay okay well fair enough okay <laughs> Mm hmm. Has anybody here done? Uh, well, I know a number of you did at least experimented with HTML because we had a lesson on that last spring. Were, were you there that day when we experimented with HTML? A few of you. OK. Uh, has anybody done Python? OK. See a few hands. Great. Great. OK. So there's a few things they've done. All right. I'll throw one last one out. Scratch. Has anybody done Scratch? Yes. OK. I even I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, that's super. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Shuttleworth. It was a pleasure, lovely to meet you guys. All right, Stu thank you so and- much for asking the questions. All right, and thank you. And we realize it is super early. These kids came in before class. We were wow. so happy to have you. Thank you, lovely to meet you guys. Have a great day. Okay, you guys have a great day as well. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks. Bye kids. <laughs> Oh, that was nice. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of an, a neat chance for the founder of Ubuntu, I think, to get to meet some of the youngest kids who are okay. going to take it into the future. I, I, I'd love to know what some of them are going to invent or do or or kind of create. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, should we continue on with the questions? Maybe, Monica, you want to take it off? All right. Let's see. So, um, all right. So we've got uh, we've got one one here um, that t talking about innovation on the de desktop, and we have a few people in our community who are worried that maybe there hasn't been as much innovation to them in the past ten years, and they were saying that that this isn't just Ubuntu, but this is kind of any operating system. Mm -hmm. So what are you kind of thinking of, of ways that we can innovate in the next five to 10 years? This was one of the questions. Um, I mean, yeah, I think there's certainly some truth to the concern, right? I think it, it's mm -hmm. absolutely clear that we've seen personal computing um, expand in form factors, but Linux, other than Android, which is, which is a success story we shouldn't forget, right? Um, thank you, Google. Effectively, um, Linux has essentially established itself in that desktop realm, and it, it, there's, there's a lot of creativity around that, but that creati creativity feels a little bit like it's in a box. So just to acknowledge the point and the question, I think there's, there's, there's truth to it. Um, um, I, you know, I do feel quite proud that that that, that we had a go at the sort of personal and um, uh, the sort of laptop, PC, m tablet, phone convergence story. I still very much actually think that that's the future. That that's where everything's headed. And Apple, in particular, really seems to be making that true. Right? If I look at the behaviors of of Mac OS, the iPad, and and the iPhone, they they, they very much seem to be converging in, 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 a, in a very careful but deliberate way, those different experiences so that they, they ultimately could become um, theory, variants on a theme effectively. Um, I think there's a lot of engineering creativity and reinvention going on. We saw obviously System D come in and that, that was a very significant kind of wave of change. Um, now there are similar things going on in various sort of subsystems one way or the other. 
Um, it may be that that desktop form factor is just a really productive thing, and it's quite hard to it's quite hard to find the next kind of optimum. Um, for for me personally, it's been an opportunity. The last couple of years have been an opportunity to go and look at other classes of compute and understand what's going on in those classes of compute. And I think those are quite important too. We were talking earlier with the, the Penguin core about IoT. Um, I don't think IoT will. I don't think great. Uh oh. Speaking of Internet of Things. <laughs> Speaking of. Uh. All right. Well, we'll just pause here. Wait for Mark's internet to start working. You let him know. Yeah. Because uh, he could just still be talking. talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Poor thing, yeah. and, he, and he'll have some absolutely brilliant answer and realize that we're not hearing it quite yet. Yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, folks, we all have connection issues. Yeah. Sorry about that. Man, it was so nice to have the kids on there. Wasn't it? Oh, my gosh. When Mark started talking to the one who um, had been programming on the Raspberry Pi. It was just, oh, that, that was great. Yeah. That's, that's, so they were sixth graders, right? Mm -hmm. Sixth graders, yeah. There we go. Okay. I am a very, very, I'm a very long way away in internet terms. I'm on a small island with a radio link in a, <laughs> a tropical climate. So oh, lots, of, yeah. lots of miracles, but they don't always like that. Um, so I was talking about IoT. I don't know if, if mm -hmm. how much of that came through, but um, it, it feels like we really have to do work um, in the Linux space to make that IoT story amazing. I, 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 I think open source free software should power that revolution. Um, and uh, we, you know, all, all the indications are that most of the connected devices in the world will be some form of open source free software. Um, it's then up to us effectively to make sure that that will be healthy, right, and easy uh, and cost effective. So th those are a really interesting area of innovation, and I love what we're doing there. Right? It's difficult, it's low level, um, but if we get it right at the low level, then it makes people to build very easily build very secure devices, build app ecosystems, and um, and you know, in, in 10, 20 years' time, we might all have homes full of things that are not, you know, rotting software effectively, that are fresh and up to date uh, in every way. So that's I think an important area of innovation um, outside of the desktop and on the cloud. Obviously, you've got you've got this massive rethink of how you run software at scale, and that's triggering an enormous amount of innovation. So um, yes, I think the desktop is. Um, uh, conservative in its in its movements, but I think the picture around that is incredibly healthy for open source. And, um, um, I don't worry about it at all. Okay, yeah, kind of picking up on that, like because this is you know desktop team. So when you talk about apps on the desktop, how do you decide what will be Flutter, GNOME, etc.? Um, I think developers are best placed to choose their tooling, right? So um, I think our job is to enable developers to get access to a wide range of development languages, development environments, frameworks, and so on. Um, and then and then they're going to write the best possible app that they can using the, the, the tool that they like the best. I think we're, we're, we're living in a kind of heterogeneous framework and language world already. That's not going to change, right? It's not like... The, 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 all, all of the, the, the web and everything, you know, the web, the kernel, and everything in between are not all suddenly going to get rewritten in, in one kind of stack. So we just have to live with, with uh, heterogeneity and uh, make, make the most of it. I think that's kind of fun, right? New things get created that, that are unexpectedly brilliant. And, um, it's, it's, you know, we've got to kind of roll with those and celebrate them and let developers make the most of them. Yeah. Monica? 
Okay, so, oh, this is actually a really good tie-in to Heather's question. That um, one of the questions was, on the internet, there's a general feeling that Canonical was focusing more on the er, more on the server side of things in in the last few years. Would you say that the recent hiring of new staff, the new logo, the new Flutter apps, um, which we know aren't complete yet, but are in the making, uh, are, are part of a rebirth effort for the Ubuntu desktop? Is Canonical giving Ubuntu desktop a new breath of life starting with the new LTS? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the work that the desktop team are doing. Um, some of that is kind of foundational work, so it takes takes a little while before people start to see the benefits of it. Um, but I, I know for a fact that, that that desktop team has never lost its focus on the desktop, right? <laughs> that team is enormously passionate about the Linux desktop and about what developers need on the Linux desktop, right? And, and it does a tremendous amount of, of work to facilitate that, not just for kind of Ubuntu GNOME, but also other flavors and variants and things built on top of Ubuntu, right? We're, we're very mindful of the fact that um, um, we enable, and it's right that we should enable lots of other takes on the Linux desktop experience. That right? just gives developers and consumers and users more, more, more choices effectively. Um, so on the, on the desktop story now, um, uh, we, we're growing the desktop team. Um, there is, an, I think, an imperative for us to raise our game. As a, as a company, we're now in a position to invest more in um, a range of things. Part of that has been to go and build teams, you know, looking at other classes of software, but, but also to grow teams that take care of things like the desktop and lead things like the desktop, right? Um, uh, so as I say, I, I know that that team is incredibly passionate. They're glad to be growing. Um, I, uh, I, I love what they're, what they're doing. Um, the rebranding, the, the kind of in, tweaks to the logo and so on, that, 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 that really reflects kind of like a, a, a revitalized canonical and a desire to essentially um, put a more consistent story together visually from the desktop all the way out through all of the different things that we are involved in from, the, from containers all the way you know, to IoT. Um, and so the desktop, I think, you know, likes to get a refresh every now and then. The community likes the opportunity to kind of take something like Yaru to a new level. Um, and uh, I'm, 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 I was quite excited when I saw that word kicking off. That is that is very exciting. Um, also, some excitement is that we are investing in a, a Linux gaming story. Yeah. So. Why is Canonical investing in games? Do you want to talk a little bit about that story? Um, so first, I think go where go where users want to go. I, you know, I think our, our job is to try to find that the, the, the best forward leading edge between what's possible and what people want, right? Uh, if it's not really possible yet, then we, we, we're not the best organization to go and create it. You know what I mean? There are other organizations that are gonna, gonna go and build a better algorithm for this or a better algorithm for that. But, we're a place where things can be brought together and then given to people who are excited about them, right? So we're kind of, we, 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 we play an important role, but we're not the most important person in any given open source kind of transaction, right? Um, but I think gaming really is interesting. Now, there's enormous demand for it, right? Lots of people game. Gaming is kind of a, a form of entertainment that's, you know, much more universal than people realize, right? Um, and, and, Linux, I think, is an important part of that ecosystem. It has been on the back end for, for many years. I think now potentially also um, uh, on, the, on the console or the, or the PC. So yes, I think you know, we brain, brainstorm all the time. What would be fun? What would be cool? What's possible? Uh, and gaming just coming, kept coming up. So we said, why not open, open up to having some people who are really passionate about that to lead and see where, see where that takes us. That's very exciting. And for those of you watching, we do have some gaming roles open. So please take a look. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I do hear that you're going to be giving a talk about that at the Linux App Summit next week. So, which That's is right, hybrid. Yeah. So you can 
tune in, a saying. That's very true. Yeah. All right. So I am going to move on for some some something kind of exciting to something equally important, even if it's not quite as glamorous as gaming, and that is uh, and that is security and privacy. So what is that story um, about kind of how that, you know, about what the desktop is doing? And that also ties into things like Snap and ESM, especially that's perfect as we just got a re re release with, with support for 10 years. And as personally, I'm an LTS to LTES fan. I appreciate that, those things. I think that's that's a, an enormous responsibility that we have to shoulder, right? Like we we need uh, if we're the, the the last point in the in the pipeline, effectively in the flow of open source to users, then then you know we're fundamentally the, the people who are responsible for whether or not that flow is is healthy, and that's an incredibly difficult job if you think of the range of of software involved and the and the, the sort of happy chaos that is open source production effectively. But there are lots of things that we can do that um, make fu a fundamental systemic difference to security and to people's security. So that's a responsibility that I think we do take very, very seriously in Ubuntu generally. And again, it's one of those things that I think we are now ratcheting up and, and investing even more in. Some of that is kind of uh, formalistic, so sort of saying, okay, if, if if you have to comply with a particular security set of policies, we can make it easier for you to comply with those policies in Ubuntu than it was previously. So that's a kind of a somewhat a, a formalism of security. I think the more meaningful stuff has to do with foundational capabilities in the kernel that uh, um, we can essentially ripple up all the way through the software stack into the consumer experience, the desktop experience, the developer experience, and elsewhere. And similarly on the cloud, and similarly on, on, on IoT. So I, I think that's one of the most important responsibilities that we should absolutely focus on. Um, our security team is one, of the, is one of the bigger teams at Canonical, and it's one of the teams that's growing the most at Canonical. So this is really an area that we're putting significant investment into. Um, um one of the one of the key tensions i think that you always see in software is security versus usability i think it's a false it's a false choice in the sense that i don't think you have to choose between those two i don't think you fundamentally have to choose between those two i think it is great people given support and given time and the ability to focus can deliver very usable and secure experiences. It just takes a lot of work. It's very hard to do. People say, you know, it's very difficult to make something very simple. It's very, very difficult to, to make something both simple and secure, right? And this is especially true when we're talking about the really dangerous cases of, you know, software that flies around with very little governance. Uh, you know, I think Firefox, Google, both really, really feel this pain, right? Your browser is having software thrown at it all the time. And they have to find a way to kind of keep that software in the box and make sure that the, the, the fun applet that you're running on, on, on the web isn't actually siphoning data out of your, out of your personal computer. Um, we have that problem too, right? We have that problem um, with tens of thousands of pieces of open source that might be coming together on the desktop. And we need to make sure that those things are really only doing what they're supposed to be doing. And even if they're compromised, that whoever's compromised them can then, you know, has to live within a box. Snaps, you know, because we're so focused on, uh, we started so focused on the Internet of Things, which where, where security is kind of mission critical, um, the, 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 the hard rule was that Snaps had to have the, the world's best security envelope around them, and that had to bring to bear everything that the kernel can do and everything that the system can do. Um, so, you know, I'm really proud of that work. You know, when, when, when I see the, the sort of really important devices that people are building and they're building on Ubuntu Core, which is all Snap, and they're building it that way precisely because of the security model, 
I think we've done we've done the right thing in making it possible for them to build devices that are that secure and effective. Um, the tension, of course, is then in, well, how do we make that really usable as an application container format for things that people want to use on their desktop? And to me, I think the important thing to remember is that nobody wants an insecure desktop. You know what I mean? Not, not everybody really appreciates this. Sometimes people who are comparing options, don't, don't, they're blind to the security consequences, right? They sort of say, well, I like this thing, I don't like this thing. They think, you know, they, 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 they both must be equally secure. Well, they're not. And, um, uh, you know, we have to choose what's important to us. I can tell you absolutely what's important to us is security, right? And then after that, usability. So we have to do the security piece first, and then the usability piece will come. Um, it's very hard. It's a lot of work, but it will come. It's important to us. Yeah, and kind of building off of that, I mean, <clears throat> snaps are great. We we love snaps, and they are very secure. Um, there are also a lot of users out there that would be interested to know if Ubuntu would ever support Flatpak out of the box. Um, some flavors do this. And so, yeah, what do you think about that? So I, I, would, I can't predict the future, of course. Uh, I can say that right now, Flatpaks would work for us. I don't think they have the security story. And I also don't think that they have the ability to, to um, deliver the same integrity of execution over time that, that Snaps have because we built those things into Snaps. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that people have a, a diversity of opinions on, on ways to solve the problem. I think that's good and healthy. Um, but I also think we're going to deliver a far better experience to developers and to users if we concentrate our efforts around something that we really can move forward. So that's certainly what, what we're going to do. Um, and there are, you know, an enormous number of applications published as Snaps. Like clearly developers like the publication experience, clearly um, consumers like the, the, the simplicity of essentially having all of that integrated into Ubuntu. Having said that, I, you know, I think the, the, um, there, there definitely are places where we will need to improve the Snap experience on the desktop. The startup performance seems really, really important. So that's, that's something that we can focus on. And also managing the boundary of security, managing the, the places where you know, quite deliberately you want to take your application out of the box. Those seem like important things to do as well. Uh, you know, I, I know that you know, this is one subject that lots of people feel very impassioned about. Um, I feel impassioned about it too, right? I want to make the very best possible um, uh, solution um, out there. But I also feel like we've, we've learned the right to go deep and, and do things properly and explore the paths that we want to explore and make those available as open source for everybody to, to use or not use as they choose, right? So that's how I feel about that. Thank you. All right. And I think that kind of building off of that is that, you know, we've talked about how so, um, Heather brought up in the in the last question, how there are some of the official flavors who kind of give people kind of more choices, like whether to use flat packs, obviously the different desktop environments. So what is your what is your opinion on the flavors and giving people those choices? And hard question, if you have a favorite flavor of Ubuntu. <laughs> I think my, sure. my, my favorite flavor of Ubuntu is, uh, is uh, Vim, because uh, that's where I, and that and the browser seem to be where I spend a lot of time these days. Um, I, I obviously, I, the, the, the thing that I run is the GNOME desktop, right? So that is our default desktop, and that's what I run. I think it's really important that we have the flavors. You know, it, it, um, is, it, it, it's always been a principle that there will be other people who want something different um, from, from the constellation of open source software that's out there. And if we can help them achieve that, that's the principle of Ubuntu, right? I'm, I'm not that interested in kind of contentious political fights because I think those just tend to make people miserable. So, you know, I'm a little bit ruthless. I will shut those down and smile about it, right? I'd much rather build a community where people agree on some things than try to sort of be responsible for a community where people enjoy disagreeing on things, right? Like, we, 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 
there are lots of those communities out there. They're, they're really quite miserable places. That's not really where I want to be. So on the one hand, you know what I mean? I think it's great that we have flavors that will, that will explore, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of the, the surface area of open source. And I think there are things that I would say go somewhere else to do, right? And uh, um, I think that's quite healthy to do that. There's lots of there's lots of room in the world for people who see things differently. But I want to collaborate with people who want to collaborate with me. And if you want to poke, you know, tweezers up my nostrils, then uh, <laughs> you, can, you can you can find somewhere else to do that. Yeah, that, that's good. I think that um, the flavor is is, is you know, it gives everybody a chance to win, right? All kinds of great, fun things, mm -hmm. creativity. There should be every color in the world, but not bitter, don't you think? Exactly. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, and also as someone who came out of the flavors, I think there's more cooperation between them than contention. Like a lot of the testing stuff where, where people from one flavor will go and test every other one and test stock and test server. So I think that yeah. for all the differences, we all realize that we're all Ubuntu, which is really great. Yeah. I think that that is that is why I believe so much in that, right? I think that has to you have to take the view that broadly speaking that's additive. If you start to if you start to fragment that landscape so that testing one thing isn't actually helping you with you know isn't actually helping everybody else, then 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 you're not really additive right in that mm -hmm. in that community in that ecosystem. That's good. Yeah. So, well. Oh, sorry, Monica. Saying we do have. I know we have our set questions, but if we want to build on that, there is one in the comments there. Oh yeah, go for it if you saw it. This is from Yannick, who is our from our Ubuntu Mate team. I think that's that's one of the great things. So I don't know if people will see the question, but the question mm -hmm. is: yep. do, do, do we essentially um, um, pick brilliant ideas out of the flavors? Well, of course, <laughs> you know, isn't that isn't that uh, that's part of the fun of having that expanded kind of sense of set of senses, which is. You know, people exploring ideas that we ourselves can't explore um, or, or didn't think to explore. So very much so. There are lots of there are lots of things that, that I think we now kind of think of as like standard things in our desktop that absolutely were ideas that first got got probed and or worked in some other flavor or some other open source community, right? Some 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 other distro. There's a, that, that constant kind of rivalry uh, is is super healthy. Fun. Exactly. Well, so speaking of, I think this goes kind of back to the question of apps. Is that the, this is one of the things about kind of apps and monetization, and how do we think? Uh, how do we get the Linux user about to think about paying something that for their preferred distribution and or the software that they use, and we know that uh, we know that Ubuntu does this with uh, with a kind of a pay what you can don uh, donation, but we know that sometimes these things kind of don't kind of don't go over well, and we know that Elementary is trying something like this with their app store, and we wonder is is this something that you see Ubuntu promoting to have you know people pay f uh, to have people pay um, be able to be paid for the apps that they develop and if that kind of can make it a more a more sustainable experience for app developers did, did i miss some sort of flame war over something elementary did no 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 but i think <laughs> but that you know but they have the store where people pay, but sometimes people just, it's a bit of an unpopular opinion. Oh, let me say, let me say like I'm 100%, <gasps> let me say I'm 100% behind the elementary guys, you know what I mean? They should mm -hmm. explore what they want to explore. If, 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 if somebody wants to use your, um, your exploration as a, as a bully pulpit or a launch pad for their own sort of bullying behavior, then that's nonsense, right? 
So I think the elementary guys should explore exactly what they want, and uh, you know, uh, I hope that, that 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 they keep their chin up if if people are throwing sticks, and uh, and see where it takes them. Um, um, so first, I think commerce is a fairly normal thing amongst human beings, right? It's not something to be totally freaked out about. Sometimes, mm -hmm. um, you know, software users and things like that can be problematic in, in lots of different ways. Um, but the basic position that um, uh, it, it's interesting to try and figure out an economic story around the social story, around the software story, around a societal story like open source, I think that's all fine. I think people should be a little gentle, uh, you know, soft around the edges as as to how how much sort of outrage they want to express about people kind of exploring different approaches. I, I very much doubt anybody's trying to lock someone in or or, or preclude them from working other ways and so on. Right? That's that's really just trying to figure out how to move this whole mix of uh, of, of things forward. Um, we were I, this was discussed quite extensively, I know, in the Snap team, um, and we were. We deprioritized it partly because it would be controversial, and Snap's are plenty controversial in, in enough as it, as it as it was, right? And we thought there were more important technical things to focus on in 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 the you know at the time, and even now I would say like some of those desktop you know performance and integration things are probably more important than um, kind of paid capabilities in the Snap Store. Um, having said that, like I'm completely supportive of um, developers' right to sort of say, hey, um, um, sponsor me if you'd like in various ways, or here's a capability that I can provide, you know, from the cloud for your software if you'd like in, in various ways. And I don't want to sound like I don't don't have opinions about which of those things I prefer and which things I don't, but I know that those are just my opinions, right? Um, and uh, um, I think I think I am, I'm sure effectively that that this will become normal in, in open source as it is elsewhere. And I don't think that'll be a bad thing at all. I'm sure that elementary flat hub, you know, and the Snap Store and other kind of software aggregation distribution capabilities will all support that sort of stuff. Perfect. And that actually seems to kind of have a bit of an answer to Danny's question there. So that was great. And speaking of, I think that this is that this is actually a good um, a good tie-in as well. Uh, is um, is there any Ubuntu Pro in the future where you pay for extra extra support or customization? Yeah, we we actually have exactly that on public clouds today, right? So um, we have always um, provided security updates for for the base platform. Um, for a certain period of time, five years effectively for free. Um, and then we found more and more companies saying, that's great, but I'd like a little more. Um, and could you do a little more? And, I mean, some of that stuff we can just do for free as well for everybody, but there comes a point where you say, well, okay, well, I, can, I can do that, but it's, it's, a, it's a chunk of extra work that not too many people care about. So let me, let me make that available for, for, for you on, on commercial terms. And the, the, the sum of all of that is available on the cloud uh, as basically like extended life and um, extended coverage effectively. Um, there, I'm, I'm very anxious that we not, or it's, it's, a, it's a very important principle to me, that we not bifurcate the Ubuntu world, right? Um, I respect and admire the work that others have done. It's a common thing to have community flavor and an enterprise flavor of the platform and I really don't want to do that. I think it's important that that you know um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm literally in the world's poorest country right now um, and uh, all this amazing stuff that happens here and but there's you know there's there's no money for for you know pro software. Um, I, I think it's very important that in a place like this anybody could use Ubuntu and they'd be fully secure, right? So I don't, I don't I really don't want to bifurcate the platform. Um, but we also have to find a way to serve the needs of people who want sort of complicated, special, sophisticated things that that it, you know is impossible or I don't know how to make available kind of universally for free. I think we can do them, but I don't know how to do them universally for free. I think it's kind of a miracle that we do what we do for free, right? Um, uh, thank, thank, thank you for our customers. Um, uh, 
so, so yeah, I'm rambling a little bit. Um, the short answer is <laughs> yes, we need to kind of expand the offering uh, for enterprises and so on. Um, uh, but no, that doesn't mean kind of splitting or forking or bifurcating the platform that finds effectively finding a way. It means finding a way to deliver for those customers um, what they need um, without compromising what we what we do for you know everybody else, everyone in the world. Okay, so that was. Um... I think that's there's a lot of like really exciting things coming. Let's talk about kind of some future stuff. I think we have announced that the Ubuntu Summit is coming, which is the reboot of the UDS that used to happen. Um, that's very exciting. So what led to bringing the Ubuntu Summit back and why change the name? How often will they be and who can attend? Um, so all really good questions. So. Um, we, we, the, 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 the UDS, the Ubuntu Developer Summit, um, like I have the best memories of the UDS. <laughs> and, um, we would get together every six months and we would get all of the canonical engineers working on Ubuntu together with a bunch of community engineers working on Ubuntu and associated open source. And we would do it somewhere in the world and we would kind of basically just spend six days nonstop talking open source and, and laughing quite a lot. Um, and uh, that was an absolute blast. Um, as Canonical grew, it got harder and harder to kind of do everything that we needed to be doing in that in that time. Like it's just too intense. Um, and so we essentially changed the way we were working um, and we, we shut down UDS and we started focusing more on sort of separate team spreads because we had too many different teams to, to you know, all be in the same place at the same time, typically. Um, um, what we lost in that process, I mean, what we gained in that process is fairly obvious, right? We gained tighter focus. We gained um, uh, a better ability to plan the specific things we cared about. What we lost in that process was sort of the, the, the happy madness of UDS, right? The sort of sense that anything could happen People come from anywhere, and there would always be something that you didn't expect that was really interesting. Right? Um, um, we also went through difficult financial times. So, like there was a, there was a period there we were just like we, we just cannot afford a couple hundred thousand dollars to fly around the world just to see what might happen. Right? Like we didn't have the, the time or the money to 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 to, to do that. Um, so now the company's profitable. One of the one of the things that frustrated me a little bit was that I thought we had lost not just, we hadn't just stopped doing UDS, but we lost the ability to really work with um, kind of what I would call forward looking community. So that's not, that's, that's community that wants to do something that you are not doing yet, right? It's, it's easier to work with kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, but kind of active community, present community, people who are, you know, have been doing stuff for a while and they know what they're doing. We know what we're doing. No, no. <laughs> there we go. Back. Oh, oh, what got lost? No, no, it's, it's good now. No, not much. <laughs> not much, okay. just a few right. seconds. <laughs> uh, it's easier to work with kind of, you know, established community, um, but it's very difficult to bootstrap new relationships and talk about new ideas without that kind of face time, right? Without that kind of getting together. So thinking about all of that, A, we started to build back up the community team. Right, and, and have more professional people focused on the community at Canonical. Um, and hopefully people have, have seen the impact of that, um, a, kind of, a kind of reboot, refresh of the kind of professional community engineering story. Uh, but we also wanted to try and find a space where, where um, we could get that, that completely open-ended dynamism, dynamic interaction. Um, so what we decided to do is do a sort of three-day event that is immediately after our internal engineering, one of our big internal engineering events. So uh, all of our engineers will be in one place and they will have a week, 10 days to, to kind of shake out a plan for everything that they're focused on. And then we can make that three-day event completely about the community. So I like the idea that it's a three-day event and it's not about canonical. Right, it's it's not about uh, us figuring out you know our story. It's it's just about the community. 
Um, open source has also moved on quite a long way. Um, and so developers aren't the only story in open source. The desktop isn't the only story in open source. So that's why we wanted to shift from the Ubuntu Developer Summit um, to the Ubuntu Summit, right? And just have you know, a, a, a forum for people who are working either on Ubuntu or building on Ubuntu or doing interesting things with Ubuntu to come together, meet each other, meet canonical people and see what happens, right? So I think it's gonna be interesting. We, I can't predict, we haven't, we haven't done it. These things are always a little bit unpredictable, um, but, but I'm really excited to, to make the space available um, and to kind of see who comes and see what comes out of it. Okay, yeah. So that that's exciting. I know I'm excited about it. <laughs> yeah, and we will definitely have a post like with where it's going to be, how people can a, how people can apply all of those things. Uh, but yeah. it will be November seventh through ninth, if I uh, if I if I remember the dates co correctly. So, so yeah. All right. So we have a um, a question, and this is um, prompted by something that Danny said, and it's about our hiring, both about the about the requirements for degrees, and also our hiring process. And so I think that this kind of ties in with some of the things that we've we know that this was a big conversation that was kind of happening both with canonical people and online. So what do you, what, you know, to someone like Danny, who might like to work at canonical, but can't because of not having a four year d d d degree, what are some of your comments on our hiring process and how we can grow to the size we want to be to make all of these things happen? Um, well, we don't have a formal requirement that, that somebody have a degree. Um, it's certainly something that we look for, um, but you shouldn't be precluded from applying um, without having a degree. And I know that I've um, hired people who don't have degrees. Um, so, you know, there, there simply isn't a a ban on people not having a degree. There are various reasons why somebody might not have a degree that don't disqualify them in any way, shape, or form from, from being the best candidate for, for a role. Um, we do have a requir requirement that we hire people who are intellectually outstanding. That's very, that's very easy to say. It's very hard to do, right, just in practice. And, and um, it's, it's both emotionally hard to do, right? Because sometimes it means that you don't hire someone you like very much. Um, and it's it's kind of executionally hard to do because sometimes you think someone's a real razor blade and they just aren't, right? Um, so on both fronts, it's a struggle, but you have to be super committed to it. And the reason I'm very, very committed to that is because I think our industry is one of extraordinary change, um, and it's also it's, it's also an industry that tends to add layers without removing them, which means that you're always in a world of kind of escalating complexities, right? And it's just important to me to offer colleagues an environment where they can count on the fact that other colleagues will will be really good, not just at one thing, but at everything that what life is going to throw at them throw at us, right? So it's a difficult conversation to have, right? Um, a, there's no perfect measure of these things, so we're going to make mistakes. Like, if there was a nice objective thing that we could do that would help us pick the best team, then we would absolutely do that, that would be done, right? Um, but unlike sort of trying to build uh, a track and field team where you can line people up and have them run it out, and you know, pick the best team based on objective results, um, the process of building a, a, a team of colleagues is is messy. So for that reason, we, we've instituted a bunch of things at, at my insistence, we've instituted a bunch of things um, that I think create a more depth of objective information in the hiring process, right? We, 
we ask every applicant to Canonical to answer a bunch of questions that are tailored for the role. There was a there was a vetted like troll fest about one that slipped through <laughs> that I didn't catch that had like the VP of engineering list of questions for a for a for an entry level engineering role. But by and large, you know, those should be that should feel like it is a hard interview. Like you went to an office, you met someone really smart, and they asked you a bunch of probing questions, and you know, you gave your answers to them. But here's the interesting thing: we ask every candidate the same set of questions. We take their we take their written responses. We give that typically to two other colleagues who review that anonymized, so they don't know whose work they're reviewing. They're looking at a piece of work. Could be could be someone from Germany. Could be someone from Indonesia. Could be someone from China. Could be someone from America, Brazil. Could be a man. Could be a woman. Could you know? Could be transgender. You know, what they have to assess is the work, right? I think that's really important. Even then, of course, there are elements of bias that are very difficult to discount for, but that's why we, that's why we typically have multiple people look at that work. We also then ask people to take an aptitude test. Again, that's a little bit like a three-legged race, you know what I mean? That's not exactly that. <laughs> You're not gonna pick your Olympic, your Olympic team with a three-legged race, but it certainly, again, helps us to, to, to choose where we're going to spend time, the combination of those things plus a resume. In addition, for some roles, we'll, we'll, we'll offer the candidate a technical test. So we'll, we'll have them do something relatively quick, which again gives us a sense of an objective sense of, of skill or awareness, familiarity with the domain, right? To let you know, we will probably process 200,000 applications for jobs at Canonical this year. We did 110 thousand applications for jobs last year. I looked at 40,000 resumes last year. I looked at 40,000 resumes last year. Right? That's why I've got no hair and I'm gray. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, a, like, it's, it's incredible the number of people who want to work at Canonical. I think because people, the mission really resonates with people. We owe it to them to try and find some objective ways to do that. And we owe it to our existing colleagues to be super, super committed, A, to hiring the best people who are you know, great to work with, but also people who are going to be able to carry their part, their, their, their pail of water, right, and evolve with, with our changing industry. It's a long, long, long spiel. You may not be satisfied, but I hope you, you, you feel that, okay, that, that, that is a fair and objective process. It is, I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, right? I know it isn't, but I know it's a substantially fairer, more objective, you know, than, than anything we were doing in the past and what most people continue to do, right? Which is, you know, they, they met someone they like, let's give it a go. Typically someone who looks like them, someone who comes from a similar background and, you know, you know, all, all of those good things, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of the way we approach this problem. I'm quite convinced that it will build a better company that will do a better job for our community and a better job for our users and a better job for our customers and be great to work with, right? Um, so anyway, you should apply. You're not precluded from applying. And, and you know, I care about that particular role, right? I care about snap crafting and I care about WSL. So I, I very much want the best candidates to, uh, to rise to the top. If that's you, then I look forward to welcoming you as a new colleague. Thank you very much for all of the answers. I think we're pretty much out of time. We are out of time. We're minus two hours or minutes. But before we leave, do you have any final um, requests or message for the community? Uh, well, first, I have some thanks. Um, it is, you know, it's somewhat humbling, I think. Uh, to be part of the open source community broadly and also part of the Ubuntu community. Um, I, I still think Ubuntu is the right word for, you know, what happens in open source, which is the sense that we, 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 ride, we raise the tide for all of us together, right? Um, so I, I'm very appreciated, appreciative of um, both people who contribute to all of open source, right? And, and then also in particular people who, who kind of join the great Ubuntu throng um, and do meaningful things in, in, in our community. I um, also want to say congratulations on the jammy jellyfish. Je, jammy jellyfish. 
best best name in a long time, best release ever, um, and uh, and and hopefully um, uh, uh, widely widely appreciated. Uh, and also just say, um, you know, we we I kind of love Canonical at the moment. Uh, the whole in, the world's gone nuts over the last year. Trump, COVID, just been crazy. Um, uh, it's been a, a sort of wild time. Um, uh, but I really feel good about you know our ability to grow and do more in the open source world. And I hope people will come along with us for for that ride. Monica, Heather, thank you very much for the opportunity. I've got to cut away, but um, yes, yeah. <laughs> Lots of people want to know. I need to go find a dictionary. <laughs> On like tomorrow, so hopefully that'll, that'll, that'll provide some inspiration. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Bye -bye. And also, thank you, thank you, everyone. everyone. All right. All right. Bye. Take care.